Hi everyone, hope you're all doing well and welcome back to another video on Amazon's New World. So when I was doing my beginner's guide last week, I did say that I would actually go on to cover each of the weapons, which builds I would use with them and which perks I might recommend taking. Well, here we are. So I'm going to kind of broadly break this video down into three categories. Tank builds, DPS builds and, well, the healer class. Now, of course, this is by no means going to be a definitive guide. The fact that you can take two weapons, and in any combination, since there are no real sort of classes as such, means there are quite a few options and combinations you can pick from. You can also, of course, spec into what I'd call sort of a hybrid build, but you are going to lose some efficiency. And particularly if you're planning to get quite heavily involved in PvP, territory wars, you know, the, the, the guild war system to be owning land in Eternum, then it is probably going to put you at somewhat of a disadvantage. And just for clarity, I would kind of consider a hybrid build to be something like taking the sword and shield as a weapon, but spacking your attribute points in it into strength for damage, or you know, a 50-50 split, rather than trying to focus on constitution to improve its tanking ability. I'm going to kick things off by running through the various DPS classes and some builds. And I guess we probably shouldn't even be calling them classes, weapons would probably be more appropriate. But just before that, I wanted to briefly cover attribute points. Because once you hit level 60, you're going to have 180 attribute points to spend. But you can expect to get at least as many again from gear. Which is why getting the right gear can play such a huge part in the effectiveness of your build. It's also worth mentioning that basically, well, all of the attributes have a soft cap of 300. Beyond that, the extra points only make a very small difference and there are no further perks to be gained. So generally, once you hit 300, that's the point you're going to be wanting to stop. And whilst we're touching on perks, yes, for every 50 points that you put into your attributes, you'll be getting a bonus perk. That's a bonus perk at 50, 100, 150, 200, 250 and 300. And yes, they stack. For example, Strength at 50 gives you increased damage to melee weapons light attack, as well as plus 10% increased mining speed. Then say at 250, you continue to get stamina regeneration while performing light and heavy attacks, and so on and so on with all the other perks across up until 300. Now, in terms of how you are going to spend your attribute points, now I'm not going to give you um, an example of every possible combination for each class build, but instead I'm going to give you broad percentages of how I would aim to build a class. For example, if you are running a DPS class, then I would be looking to put around 75% of my attribute points into damage. So by that I mean strength, dexterity or intelligence, depending on if you're using melee weapons, ranged weapons or magic. I'm going to cover a little bit about how some weapons scale off two attributes, but for now, just think of these three attributes as damage attributes, just relevant to the melee range or magic, depending on which weapon you're going to be using. And then the remaining 25% of your attribute points are going to be wanting to go into constitution. This really does kind of become a requirement because it gives you some element of survivability, some element of buffer to keep yourself in the fight. And no DPS can just be an ultimate glass cannon because well, you just don't really tend to survive enough. You don't get time for your team's healer to get to you and keep you in the fight. So for a tank though, I would basically completely flip this on its head with 75% of my attribute points going straight into constitution. This is what's going to give you a really good health pool to work with. It's going to allow you to um, both, well, it doesn't allow you to increase the threat, but it's going to allow you to draw the damage from the enemy bosses in the raids, in the fights, in the PvP battles, and tank that damage, and give your team's healer time to get you topped up and keep you in the game. And then I would only be putting, you know, around the 25% into damage, because as a tank, you're not about damage, you're about absorbing damage. So your damage output really isn't that important. That's why I've gone so heavily focused towards constitution. Then finally, if you're going to be working as a healer, I think I'd be looking to go somewhere between 75 to 100% into focus. It depends slightly, in my opinion, on how involved in PvP and wars you are going to be. If you're just going to be running around doing PvE stuff, expedition, bosses, then 
realistically, you probably can get away with 100% focus. You can really avoid all the damage and keep yourself out of the fight. So long as you've got a good tank in your group who's going to keep that aggro, keep that threat, then you should be okay. But in wars, things do get a little bit more difficult. That extra 25% into constitution can be really helpful in giving yourself sort of some element of buffer, particularly if the enemy team starts to focus you down. Anyway, that's enough talk about attribute points. Let's kick things off with the first weapon, and I want to start with the hatchet. A single-handed axe that actually fits in pretty well with a lot of other weapon builds, because not only does it have really good base damage, but with the Berserker Master Tree, it also has a significant amount of sustain and self-heal. The weapon itself scales primarily off strength, with dexterity as its secondary. This, at least in my opinion, makes it one of the few weapons that are very viable to work with as a ranged secondary weapon, because it has that high base damage. For example, you could run this with a musket, and you'd spec your attribute points into dexterity. This would mean the musket gets maximum damage, and whilst the hatchet would lose a little bit compared to if it's scaled off strength, it would still be a very effective weapon. It's also one of the few weapons that scales entirely off of one Masku tree, rather than a combination of the true, which most of the builds here we're going to look at do. And that tree is of course the Berserker tree. Yes, you're losing out on any of the hatchet's ranged ability, but the sustain you're going to be getting from Berserker is hugely useful in keeping yourself alive in both PvE and PvP fights. This, combined with the great burst damage, makes it a really viable weapon in my opinion. For attack combination, you're generally going to be wanting to activate Berserker from the off. I'd then be getting stuck in with a few light attacks before probably activating Feral Rush, particularly if the target turns their back at any point, because remember, Feral Rush gives a two second route to enemies if you get a hit from behind. So if the opportunity to land that rear hit occurs, absolutely make it because a two second route is hugely useful and if you get that two second route you can then follow up with the raging torrent for that huge amount of burst damage and that's really for me in that sort of combination what makes the hatchet a very viable weapon even though it has had quite a few nerfs from where it was in the alpha okay so we have covered the hatchet and i'm now going to move on to the musket since we talked about the hatchet being sort of a viable pair with a ranged weapon the musket is a really interesting one for me and one I've actually been trying out during the beta because it has insanely high alpha damage. Yes, it shoots slowly, its actual base DPS probably isn't that high, but its range and lack of drop off is huge and it can take big chunks out of the enemy's health, particularly if you manage to hit headshots. For that reason, I've gone for the approach of only using two abilities here with everything else in the Mask UP tree being specced towards increasing that burst damage to maximising those big hits and hopefully occasional one-shots. The first ability is Powder Burn, which not only gives good base damage, but applies a 9 second ticking burn damage to the enemy, which is actually increased to 13 seconds in the event of a headshot. The second ability, Power Shot. This is going to give you 150% base damage, which gets even higher with a headshot and is just a great base alpha damage ability. Combination wise, I'm going to try and hit them with the powder burn first. Not only will this take a reasonable chunk of health out of them, but it's going to apply that burn damage. You know, if the enemy stops to heal to deal with that, then I'm going to be trying to go for that headshot with the power shot, which should hopefully do significant critical damage and maybe actually enough to finish them off. It may seem like this is kind of a not very well rounded build it's quite niche it's quite focused in what i'm trying to use it for but i think that's what makes it work so well and you're using this in combination as a secondary weapon yes it's not the most rounded class but what it does it does it pretty excellently well with the musket out of the way i want to move on to the spear a weapon i haven't actually yet used in the beta but have previously enjoyed it's capable of dealing pretty large amounts of damage in small bursts, yet also capable of locking enemies down with some of its debuffs. Interestingly, the spear actually primaries with dexterity, with strength as a secondary attribute. Abilities wise, I think I would be looking to make use of Vault Kick 
perforate and sweep. You know, I'd be trying to use the Vault Kick to sort of stun and lock the enemies down to then really allow me to get much closer in. And then I'd probably be trying to make use of perforate to get the maximum damage against them before then trying to follow up with sweep to stop the enemies from actually being able to activate any of their abilities, stop them from being able to heal themselves, and then hopefully you can just get back onto the normal light and heavy attacks during everything else on cooldown, and hopefully by that point the enemy should be dead. The spear is probably a little bit more difficult to pick up than some of the other weapons we have in the game. When I first got my hands on it um, during the Water preview event sometime last year, it certainly had me fairly confused. And uh, yeah, picked up some pretty horrible footage of me playing it terribly. So it certainly is a class that can be a little bit difficult to learn initially. Next up, we have got the Ice Gauntlet, a weapon that was actually only very recently revealed and added into the game. But the Ice Gauntlet is very good for keeping objectives and punishing users who stay in one position for a prolonged period of time. Essentially, the Gauntlet puts the playing field in your hands making enemies leave an area of play or face a constant barrage of attacks. The main abilities I'd probably be looking to recommend for Ice Gauntlet are going to be Pylon, Ice Storm and Entombed. And as for how these are going to work in a combo, you ideally want to make sure you're getting your Ice Pylon placed down right at the start. And then you're basically trying to spend time avoiding the enemies, trying to prevent them from getting too close to you. Because all the while whilst this is going on, the pylon is starting to shoot at the enemies. If, however, they do get too close to you, you can activate Ice Storm to slow them down and apply damage, all the while then you're making use of these light and heavy attacks to continuously apply damage to the enemies as they're trying to catch up to you. If you then find yourself basically out of mana or find yourself in a bad spot, you can then always activate your Entombed to regenerate your mana pool very quickly. It's also probably worth adding that the AoE of Ice Storm can be extremely effective in wars, where it can cover um, an objective and basically force groups and groups of enemies off a certain point. It allows you to sort of control a zone of area and keep people from going on a spot that you don't want them to be in, which can, well, can make it such a valuable class during wars. I feel like the bow is a weapon that has kind of struggled slightly more recently in popularity. It's just not something that I've really been seeing that much used during the beta. But it can still be a hugely effective weapon in what it can do, and it's kind of like the ultimate fast acting range DPS class, which can put out really good amounts of damage at range. Like the musket, the bow of course requires arrows. Oh ammunition in the case of the musket so you've always got to have this stuff in your inventory always make sure you are stocked up but for the mastery build i'd be wanting to use the abilities of poison shot evade shot and penetrating shot essentially with the exception of the evade shot you are always trying to make use of these highly damaging abilities if the enemies stay in one place or run out of stamina you should be using poison shot and penetrating shot to punish them for their mistakes but if they start to bear down on you or get too close, making use of evade shot is a great way of breaking contact and sort of putting some distance between yourself and the enemy. It's also worth remembering that poison shot does have an AOE effect, which can make it kind of effective against clusters of enemy. It can be a very effective weapon, the bow. And you're also trying to make use of, you know, regular light and heavy attacks and obviously trying to land those headshots when you can. The Rapier can make for an absolutely fantastic DPS weapon, as it has really high crit chance rates and some pretty gnarly bleed effects which can take down enemies over time quite effectively. Which means that, on paper at least, Rapier can really be one of the most damaging weapons in the game. Like the Spear, the Rapier actually primaries with Dexterity, but instead has Intelligence as its secondary scaling attribute. But in terms of the mastery abilities that I'd probably wanting to be used with the Rapier, I'd be looking at Tondo, Evade, and Flesh. In terms of playstyle though, you're basically trying to initially make use of Tondo to slash and stab from a bit of a distance because it extends your blade, and trying to start applying those bleed stacks to the enemy. If the range gets closer, you can continue to follow up with light attacks, until you're in danger, the enemy's trying to lock you down or trying to counter you. 
then you're going to be trying to activate your evade. This not only gives you the temporary invulnerability, but it's also giving you that sidestep to get yourself out of danger and dodge those enemies' abilities. If you then get an opening, you can follow up with flesh to lunge forwards and get that stabbing, doing that really high base damage, going for that nice hit. Although, I guess it's also worth pointing out that flesh can also be used just as an escape skill to put some distance between yourself and the enemy. And of course, throughout this whole thing, those bleed stacks that you remember you applied with Tondo at the start are still racking up damage against the enemy. Fire Staff. Actually, a weapon I have never used in either the beta or the alpha. So I had to go out and find some experts on this one to find out about the best builds for the Fire Staff. And more than likely, unless I've suddenly fell head over heels in love with it in the beta, I won't actually have any footage by the time this gets edited because I do want to get this video out before the beta ends, so you're now probably just looking at the mastery screen. But I hope it should still be very useful all the same. The Fire Staff is the hardest hitting magic weapon in the game so far. It has the high crit chance and can also make use of ranged or close up attacks to burn its foes to death. In terms of mastery abilities though, I'd probably be recommending Fireball, Incinerate and Burnout. But it's worth bearing in mind that on this one, on the mastery, the passives are also really, really important. When in combat, you should generally be making use of heavy attacks as they're not going to be using mana with some of the passives selected in this build. And if the enemies do become too stationary, you can make use of fireball to set them and the ground underneath them afar on fire and sort of build up some of that stacking damage. If they start to get too close to you, you can also make use of incinerate or burnout to drive them back and put some distance between them and yourself before returning to the previous heavy attacks. I guess it's probably also worth mentioning that if you're a very heavy PvE focused player, then you may also consider flamethrower, but I think it's generally considered that the above build is a bit of a better all round build. The healer is probably the most important class in the game. And the life staff is the currently the only healing weapon available. You know, if you and your group want to run expeditions, wars, invasions and world bosses, then you will be needing a healer. Whilst it's also one of the most thankless jobs in the game, it can also be one of the hardest, as you're trying to manage multiple other players at the same time, keeping an eye on not only their own health and adjusting your play accordingly to keep them all in the fight, and all the while you're also trying to avoid danger and trying to not get yourself killed in the fight yourself. But for weapon mastery abilities, I would be selecting Divine Embrace, Sacred Ground and Beacon. But I'm going to go on to suggest two different playstyles for PvE and PvP healing. So for PvE, I would recommend constantly using light attacks to heal allies. If a player then drops below something like 70% health, then you would want to use Divine Embrace on them. If, however, one of your allies is being continuously attacked, such as the team tank, then use Sacred Ground as this will help recover not only their health, but also their mana and their stamina as well. And if things get really tight, things start to go really badly when you're fighting those world bosses, you can always call upon Beacon to target a specific person or as an OE, AOE. And yes, it does combine with Sacred Ground to give 30% extra healing in the AoE circle. However, for PvP, or more specifically Territory Wars, then things are going to be a little bit different. Your primary aim is going to be to keep at the back and stay alive. You're then going to be making use of Divine Embrace on basically anyone whose health is getting low. And frankly, in a 50v50 fight, that is going to be a lot of people. When you start to run out of mana though, you're going to either have to pop a potion, which hopefully you've brought with you to the war, or you can use Sacred Ground upon yourself and wait for your mana to regen. But if you do find yourself starting to get targeted by enemies, then you can actually still target yourself with control and clicking the skill. You know, make sure to throw a Sacred Ground and Beacon down on the ground and heal yourself. And then you can use Divine Embrace on yourself with that control click ability. Healing is certainly one of the more challenging jobs in the world. But as I kind of mentioned earlier, it's also one of the most important and is absolutely critical for any group in either PvE or PvP combat. Being secondary to perhaps 
only healer, the job of the tank is hugely important in New World, and there really isn't a better weapon to use for it than Sword and Shield. It is the primary tanking weapon. It is the only weapon in the game that can block projectiles. Well, I guess at least the shield part of it does anyway. But it also produces a lot of threat, which means it is far easier for the Sword and Shield to gain and hold aggro from enemies than any other weapon. This is, you know, going to allow the healer to focus on just one player rather than trying to manage a lot of them and the DPS classes to safely apply their damage without being as sort of quickly taken out by the bosses. The weapon itself scales primarily off strength with dexterity as its secondary and in terms of the mastery abilities you should be taking whirling wind, shield bash and final stand. And in PvE fights you are constantly trying to gain and keep hold of the aggro from the enemy you're using shield bash and final stand while making use of whirlwind and light attacks to apply a little bit of damage which in turn helps increase your threat and helps you to keep the aggro. This can also be bolstered by slotting a Canalian gem on the sword which also significantly increases threat. But your primary goal for the whole of this is to keep the threat, keep the focus of the enemies on you so the rest of your team can deal with them. In PvP however, things are slightly different. You want to be on the front line, getting close to the enemies, making more use of your heavy attacks. If advancing on range users, make sure to use your block to reduce the chance of getting hit and taking range damage, and try and get close enough to make use of your shield bash, stun them in place before following up with heavy and light attacks to slowly chunk them down. It's not necessarily one of the most glamorous jobs in the game being a tank, but the Sword and Shield does it very well and it is a key part to any team. So we have two weapons left to go, Great Axe and Warhammer. You may be wondering why I left these two as the last sort of two to run through, but it's because in my opinion they both make great secondary weapons for a tank. To take Warhammer first is great for locking down enemies and creating AoE, and it makes for a fantastic secondary weapon and can be swapped into stun, slow and knock down enemies. It's also worth pointing out that the Warhammer is only going to be scaling off strength. But in terms of the mastery abilities, I'd recommend you take Mighty Gavel, Shockwave and Path of Destiny. You can then use Mighty Gavel to knock down your enemies, Shockwave to stun your enemies and Path of Destiny to slow your enemies, giving you a really great amount of crowd control, which is why it's such a nice sort of accompaniment to the Sword and Shield, which has very little. I'd finally end on the Warhammer by pointing out that despite being very slow, the Warhammer's heavy attacks do hit super hard, so if you can land them, they are well worth using. And so last, but certainly not least, we have the Great Axe, which, as I mentioned above, also makes for a great pairing with tanks, as the passive perks on the tree allowed you to build up and deal out damage to enemies who stay close to you due to the stacking damage per hit, so you're not really losing out much not having all your attribute points in strength. As with the Warhammer, Great Axe only scales with strength and should really be used to help along with the Sword and Shield to pull enemies towards you and away from the DPS and healers, locking them into combat. The mastery skills I'd recommend for this one are Charge, Reap and Maelstrom. The general combo for this or something like this would be Charge, followed up by a Light Attack, followed up by Reap. This is then pulling the enemies back towards you with your axe, keeping them in combat. Follow up with another Lighter Attack, followed up by Maelstrom, which is then going to suck your target back towards you if they're trying to escape again. And if of course if they're not trying to escape, you're building up this damage every time, really starting to apply a lot of damage to the enemy. Then, with all your abilities exhausted, you can just switch back to the Sword and Shield for more traditional tanking. And so, that's it. We have covered every weapon in the game so far. Although, I'm sure they'll end up adding in more weapons in the future. I also wanted to say that this video is of course by no means exhaustive. There are loads of potential builds available in the game, and multiple ways in which different weapons may be used well. I'd certainly recommend you go out and check out the New World Fans class builder that I used in this video 
Those guys did a fantastic job building that thing and it's super helpful for allowing you to test out different combinations, check out your attribute points, different mastery tree specs, certainly worth checking out. I'll put a link in the description and the comments. Finally, I just want to give a huge thanks to Brafania and Talox for their help making this video. And if you enjoyed it and found it helpful, then please do let me know in the comments down below. And of course, subscribe to the channel as we have got so much more New World content on the way. Thanks for watching, guys, and I shall see you all on the next one.